watch on replay eventually. We already have talked about prayer, though. Really? We did when we, when we talked about the liturgy. Oh, I can put things on the screen, too, uh, whatever we end up looking at. Uh, it's a big topic, so you know, we're only going to have so much time. But um, when we talked about the liturgy, I, we mentioned that that was a kind of prayer. That prayer is, uh, maybe, what do you want to say it's, what is it basically? you have a definition? Talking with God. Yeah, I think, I th- yeah, I think talking with God's, you know, a good, good definition. Of course, then the question is, what does God want to hear about? <laughs> <laughs> um, right. Well, I think that's imp- I think that's helpful and a helpful corrective because that's generally when we talk. I would write it on the board. Um, generally, when we talk about prayer, we think of um, we use this word petition, and the Lord's Prayer in particular has one, two, three, four, seven petitions, which is a nice complete number, right? But petition is asking, uh, but it's not necessarily asking when there's a complaint, it could be, what would be another kind of petition? I don't know if we usually call a petition, like when we give thanks to God, right? But that's, that is a kind of prayer too, is giving thanks to him, Um, which we're probably not good at. We're not generally, I don't know about you, but I'm not very good at saying thanks in general, (laughs) right? Even to like, you know, I would get in trouble with grandma all the time. You didn't write me a thank you note. (sighs) Sorry, grandma. There's there's a acronym. Okay. I forget what the first one is. And then there's adoration. Like honor, maybe? Could be. Mm-hmm. And then and, and then the last one is supplication. Supplications, yeah. So prayer um, is communication with God. It's what Adam and Eve did at the beginning before the fall into sin. Actually, if you wanted to describe the, the temptation and then the sin was to no longer talk with God, but to talk to oneself. <laughs> Right, to find within one's own resources, like, what do I think of that fruit? Well, who cares what you think of it? What did God say about it, right? Well, it looks good for food. Well, God said it wasn't, so, right? And in and, um, and that story, that's interesting um, when it comes to prayer, because, you know, Adam is there, and Adam fails to provide a corrective and say, hey, let's pray to the Lord, because we're being tempted, right? Let, let's seek out the Lord in prayer. That is, listen to what he has had to say and pray that back to him um, to correct us, right? So that we so that we think about these things the way that he wants us to think about it. Um, and then he is cut, Adam is cut off from God in a sense. He no longer walks with God in the cool of the day. But that's how Adam and, and Eve, by extension, view their relationship to God now. They've cut themselves off. And yet God seeks them out and he's constantly speaking to them. So even though they think they've cut themselves off from communication, right, which is what happens in a broken relationship, right, you stop talking, um, God doesn't view it that way. He's like, he's long suffering. He's patient. These are the ways we describe him. Um, this is actually what he gives to us too. We'll hear in the sermon, but, um, but he keeps talking to them. They don't always want to listen, right? Which says something maybe about prayer. Uh, why do, why do we, why would you fail to pray? Was well, because you think God won't hear you maybe, or, or he doesn't care about what you have to say, right? I think sometimes maybe it's because our prayers, like, like you were saying, there, there's more to it than just complaining. Although that, that is a kind of prayer. Um, but you can also, you can look at the Psalms as examples of prayer. There really are. They're poetry too, but there's prayers. It's like we, David, David or the other psalmists pray against enemies. So you, that's a kind of prayer to say, you know, um, I don't know, Marla, I try, I just, pick on you because you brought it up publicly before, but you know, like praying against your neighbor, you know, who, for whatever reason, right? <laughs> Rather than complain, well, right, right, but what good does that do? Unless you say, God, you know, change his heart, right? Or, or give me a new neighbor or whatever. You take, or God change my heart. Oh, that's true too, right? Maybe I'm the problem, right? And, and just act with a little bit more humility. Um, and part of this has to do, you have to Turn the thing to open and then push the button on the top. Sorry. Japanese, they think it's intuitive. Uh, So, prayer. The best kind of prayer, I would suggest then, um, is the kind of prayer that the Lord teaches us to pray. 
And there's a couple of reasons for that. One, you're going to be praying uh, the words that he gives you. So that's good. Um, and, but then as an extent or consequence of that, you can have confidence that he hears you. So if he says, pray this way, then, and you pray that way, you have his promise as well, right? Attached to that. Um, and that's what's going on with the Lord's Prayer. I can, I can put it up on the screen so you both got it here. Um, you probably know the Lord's Prayer, or I hope you do. That's one of the things we want to learn. Mm. Mm. Yeah, so, um, da, 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 large, ca or small catechism, we did that, we need to go to, that was the creed, we did the creed, all right, how do you get out of the creed, you have to make it smaller so you can get that little thing up in the corner, website design, Teresa knows about this, I don't think they do, like, user interface testing, you know, where you send it out to people and say, figure out how to use the site, and then, you know, they you can do this and they record it. And then you could say, and they're like, I don't know what this site's all for. I don't know how to use it. And I go, oh, we need some work to do. All right, so there it is. Uh, we keep the old language. I think we talked about that last week. Don't change the words. Did we talk about that? Sometimes we use these archaic language just because that's how we learned it. Psalm 23 is that way for people. They learned it from the old King James, and so they say it that way. Yeah, yeah. So same thing with the Lord's Prayer. So we have some kind of important words that we have to talk about. Um, but maybe, actually, before we do this, maybe you need a little context. Um, we could do this from any of the gospel, well, any of the Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But I think, if I can remember how to use a tablet, um, we should do it. We'll do it from Matthew. Matthew is probably the closest as far as the text goes. All right, so Jesus, this is in his Sermon on the Mount, and um, he's been teaching them about the commandments. Um, and about love or charity, and now he's going to teach them about prayer. And he gives a bunch of instructions about prayer here in this context. And, you know, he's like, prayer is not a, a public performance, right? So you don't need to be, you know, long-winded or flowery with your language. Um, as a matter of fact, you don't even have to public, pray in public. In this, he says, um, don't do it the way that the hypocrites do. That would be the Pharisees. And scribes who go out in the, either in the synagogues and make, make impressive prayers or do it at the street corners. Instead, just go in, into, your, um, into, your, into your room, right? Shut the door and pray. And he will hear your prayers. Don't pray vain repetitions. And that's an interesting one, too. Uh, vain repetition. So that's like um, in the East. Yeah, like the Hail Mary. That would be Western. I was thinking more Eastern. Um, you know, like mantras? You know about mantras, right? Like the in Asia or India or whatnot, where there, is, there are Christians today who think, they call these centering prayers, where you pick a word and you say the prayer, that word over and over and over, and it somehow focuses you. It's very strange. Um, the Jesuits like that. Anyway, I think they picked it up from the East. The only reason I say the Hail Mary mm -hmm. is because when Jerry worked um, in Catholic schools, Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, <coughs> if, if you've watched like Mother Angelica on EWTN or something, right, on cable, have you watched her? She's deceased now, but they still play her on replay, so you get to listen to her praying, even though she's dead. Anyway, um, yeah, it was kind of, uh, the, the way that the nuns in the video do it, they, they have like a drone to it, you know, it's kind of, mon not monotone. Um, I mean, there's, there's a bunch of questions that you would ask, it's like, well, why pray it more than once? I, I'm not saying, like the Lord's Prayer, Luther in the small catechism instructs us to pray, well, depending on how many meals you have a day, you know, somewhere between three and five times a day. It's like, well, does it, does it work better if you say it more often? You know? Um, now, the Lord's Prayer is a unique example, I think, because it's a prayer that the Lord gives us to pray. He actually gives us the words. So it is, it, it not only is prayer from our heart, but it's also words that he has given us to speak. So it's a little bit different than the prayers that, that we come up with, right? Um, but, I mean, there's, there's some, there is an advantage to repetition, as teachers and parents know, right? Doing the same thing each day helps. <laughs> um, habits, habits are help, can be helpful. They can also have bad habits, I suppose. 
Yeah, and it's practice. Um, there's a way that the ancients understood this is that first you have to learn the words and only then can you consider like what the words mean. But first you learn the words. And this is, of course, thinking of children. It's, um, they don't necessarily understand, like, what am I asking for? But it's okay because Jesus gave us the prayer, right? And so first you just, just say the words, right? And wor worry about what it means later on. Um, and obviously the meaning will, will adapt to the situation. I mean, what daily bread means to you today is rain. <laughs> Whereas tomorrow it might mean, um, you know, safety or protection or something when you're in danger, depending on what your situation's in. So the petitions, especially in the Lord's Prayer, can there. Um, this is important to note about the Lord's Prayer. It's comprehensive, so it prays for everything that God has promised, but it can be highly specific to a, to a given moment then as well. All right. So anyway, I'm um, saying, don't, you know, vain repetitions. You don't have to repeat over and over, mantra style. Um, for they think, that would be the hypocrites, that, uh, by the way, a hypocrite is someone who um, outwardly gives the illusion of faithfulness, but inwardly does not believe. That's what that means. You know, so, um, you know, be kind of like, I don't know, a federal attorney standing up and say no one's above the law, but then failing to prosecute certain people and only prosecuting certain ones. Right? It's hypo that's hypocrisy. Like, if no one's above the law, then why aren't you prosecuting everybody else who does this, has done the same thing, right? And pointing out that hypocrisy doesn't seem to matter to anybody. It's like, well, they, you know, it's okay to do, well, be careful what you do against your enemies, because it will then often be done against you, right? What do they call that? Karma? Hmm. Yeah, well, that's Eastern, too. That's not in the Bible, but, um, but God actually gives back to you what you mete out to others, so... Yeah, that's a little different. All right, so you don't need to say a lot of words, which is helpful. So sometimes think, people think prayer needs to be long or extensive. Uh, don't be like them. For, and this is a key, your father knows the things that you have need of before you ask him. Which then is a question. Well, why are we asking for things if he already knows we need them? Mm, sometimes, yeah. It's because we don't believe that he has... He gives these things to us. So the prayer is, yes, it's asking for God, and he loves to hear, hear us ask, but he loves to hear us ask because it demonstra it's a demonstration of the faith that he's worked in our hearts, right? So now we trust him to ask for these things. Yeah, so we pray for the things that we don't believe in, which is kind of a hard thing to, to get your head around, I suppose, but maybe, maybe not. You know, so when we go to church, you know, we ask for strength and comfort and hope and peace and joy and patience and these aren't things that we necessarily come to church with probably not actually although today like i say there'll be some people we probably should add a petition for in thanksgiving for rain after hopefully it'll still be raining i'll hear it all right um in this manner therefore pray so then he teaches them to pray this is a little different than in luke's gospel right because this is in the context of that big sermon on the on the mountain right but the petitions are pretty straightforward uh, first, it starts with our Father in heaven. And, you know, you can notice the language is a little bit different than what we pray out loud, but it's close enough. Uh, the key there is our, which tells you something about what Matthew has in mind. I should show you the Luke version since I just said it. All right, yeah. Why don't you just go there? I, how do I do that? I have to do that? <coughs> yeah, there's the Luke version. Now, the Luke version is a different context. He says... Uh, the disciples come, he's praying, and they say to him, Lord, teach us to pray. As John, that's the Baptist, taught his disciples. Some of them were John's disciples. So then there he gives the same thing. But in both cases, you notice they start the same way. Our Father in heaven. And the hour is, is really a key here. I don't know. I mean, Father is also pretty significant because if you're calling him Father, then that means you are his child. Yeah. So you have a particular relationship there with God by baptism, right? um, that you've been made children of God, that now you can, um, you can ask him for anything as, as dear children ask their dear father, Luther says in the catechism. But it's our, so it's plural, right? And a third person plural. So it's talking about Jesus saying he's, God's his father, but also he's the disciples' father. And then as we pray it, it's, he's our father. So the context then is interesting. 
is that it's often, it can be prayed alone, my father, you could say, but if it's our father, then it's prayed together with others often, right? So you were saying this together. So it ends up having then, like you said, um, liturgical function. It's used in the, in the worship of the church. All right, our Father in heaven, oh, we could talk about everything here, but <laughs> in the interest of time, probably not. Um, hallowed be your name. So your name is kept holy. That's the second commandment, if you remember. Don't misuse God's name. That means use it correctly. When we're praying the prayer, we're actually using God's name the way he wants us to use it. It's, that's why it starts that way. Hallowed be your name. That's what we're doing here. We're calling upon you and your name um, for what, what we need. All right. um, your kingdom come, which, again, we could go through the catechism on each of these parts, but it's, it's a whole bunch. But the kingdom of God is actually talking about Christ's reign, Christ Jesus' reign, and that his reign, Jesus is very clear, my kingdom is not of this world, so the kingdom he's talking about is the kingdom, we'd say, of faith or um, his word, which we normally just call the church, right? Wherever the king is, that is where Jesus is, there his kingdom is, right? But we're asking his kingdom to come, meaning we're asking him to um, either bring his church to us or that we brought, be brought into his church and that we remain there, right? So this is also talking about the preservation of faith then in Jesus, mm -hmm. Now, does this kingdom come without our prayers? Luther says, yes. <laughs> so then why pray for it, right? Again, um, so that we believe that his kingdom comes. Where were we? Let's go back to Matthew. I don't think it's that much different, but it's worth. Yeah, it's the same. Your kingdom come. Mm -hmm. um, we were... No, no, it's fine. You're jumping ahead? Okay, then we'll get there. Your will be done. Uh, God's good and gracious will is done without our prayers, Luther says but we pray that it may be done amongst us. How do we know what his will is? That is what God wants for us. He wants every good and gracious thing for us. Mm -hmm. us. Yeah, and do we know what those things are? Um, maybe. Maybe. Generally speaking, and you know. Oh, I see what you're saying. The, the, the basics. Yeah, <clears throat> yes. <clears throat> okay, good. Yeah, so I don't think here we are in particularly, really the, hmm, I can't draw it up on the board. These are things I would draw on the board. As I put right next to this, the Ten Commandments, um, because the Ten Commandments makes, make demands that we cannot fulfill, but that are still good for us, right? That we have no other gods and that we call upon God's name and that we receive his word, you know, in Sabbath, um, and that we love our neighbors as ourselves, right? That's good for us and for our neighbors. That's the Ten Commandments, but we don't, actually, we don't actually have the ability to do them, even though God demands them. The Ten Commandments is asking God to actually give those things to us. So there's a, there's a parallel here that if you want to break, put a break right at verse 11, the, this deals with Commandments 1 through 3. All right. So, and I think Luther is right about that. So that, um, hallowed be your name is second, our Father in heaven, we have no other gods, and then also, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The good and gracious will of God is, is done without our prayers. What is his will? It's very specifically that his kingdom come, that is, and that we receive all the gifts of his kingdom. We know his will because he's told us. All right, so that was the answer I was looking for. <laughs> it's okay. Um, he's told us what he wants for us. Not in everything, right? Like, not necessarily like what job to take or what to have for breakfast, or I don't know, f you figure it out, right? Things that have to do with the daily, daily life. Um, and those things, it's not that he doesn't work his will for us, um, but he has given us, uh, what do you want to say? Freedom to operate within the world um, uh, as we choose fit. So that isn't to say that sometimes we're not compelled, right, to marry a particular person. Um, although we still ask God that his will be done there because, you know, we don't always make the right choice on that. Um, where to work, you know, to be a teacher here, for example, God extended, we would say he called you, right? But in a sense, there was also the like, well, I believe that God has called me, right? There was an ascent that was go going on. So Marla agreed to be a teacher as well. Not, we didn't just tell her you have to come and if you don't, you're, you know. <laughs> Inc incidentally, um, 
one of my relatives who's uh, was related to this guy, Mr. Wamsgans, um, who actually ended up being a pastor up here, but he, um, uh, where was he? He was connected to Trinity Freistadt, but I think he was in Fredonia, if I remember right. It doesn't matter. Um, I was reading his autobiography, which is interesting. We have a few autobiographies of pastors generations ago. I don't have any, there's no, I'm the first pastor in four generations, I think. But so this is a long time ago, or three generations. And we have a lot of school teachers, but different vocation. Anyway, he talks, he accepted every call. So every time a congregation said to him, we'd like you to be your pastor, he went. So he ended up serving like 14 congregations. He would be in a place for a year or two, and then he'd go. It's like, that's traumatic. <laughs> no, thank you. Um, he didn't quite, but he didn't have that. I don't know if it was in the spirit of the air that you just did whatever the congregation told you. Maybe. You know, it's a call of the church. Um, but I don't, if one congregation calls you or asks you to be their pastor, you still have a call or, you know, you have a congregation that you're serving. So now it's like God can't make up his mind. Well, then I guess you have to, right? That's kind of how it looks in our church body. It's kind of weird because we don't have bishops, you know, that say, hey, priest, you need to go over here or you'll go there. Um, yeah, he was kind of like a gypsy. Uh, often he would go, but no visits, no interviews. You just go. They send you paperwork, but um, he'd show up and they'd be like, oh, actually, you're going to be teaching and you're going to be doing this and that. And they didn't tell you. I didn't. I, and so he says, like, oh, I didn't have any experience being a teacher. I just They had a school and I had to teach in the school. Like here, that was the case here. The pastor was both. All right. Anyway, so um, his will specifically here connected to your kingdom come. We're talking about the matters of salvation, that you'd be brought into the faith, that you receive um, the gifts that Jesus gives, both his word, his sacrament, that you'd be forgiven daily. Right. That's his will. And th those are things that are confident and sure. And they last not only now, but into eternity. The decisions or the will that he might exercise now, no nothing's forever in this world. Right. That's actually an expression we say. But it's true, right? God doesn't actually tell you what tomorrow is going to bring. No. Um, so he doesn't tell you. And then, of course, we worry about it. And he also says, don't worry about it either, because it, tomorrow is mine, right? It's God's. He's the Lord. Um, so we tend to think of this more in terms of, like, earthly life. But I think what you want to see here is this, this phrase really answers what's going on on earth as it is in heaven. So we're talking about heavenly things, and we want them to be done on earth. What are the things of heaven? Salvation, eternal life, resurrection, right? So we're asking those things to be done here. All right. Then we can go maybe to the second uh, table of the Ten Commandments. So, you know, with, with family and with life, I'm doing it in the positive sense, right? Family, life, property, no, six. Oh, marriage. Um, oh, I should say parents <laughs> and authority. Um, life, marriage, then property, uh, reputation, and, um, and then nine and 10 are kind of catch all of those. But now those things we also need, right? Marriage is good. Parental authority is good. Or another authority, right? Property is good. Have stuff. Yeah. Today, the, the um, gospel text, which I'm going to preach on, you know, seems like, and we get a lot of these in the summer, actually, about three or four Sundays where we talk about kind of the challenge of, of material wealth, right? Um, I was watching a show. It's a terrible show. I don't recommend it. But, um, you know, once you've invested like a, into a season, anyway. when you watch like five episodes and there's only seven, you're like, ah, I might as well just, I hate my show. it doesn't matter. Um, but the, but the character, <laughs> the character on it is a totally hedonistic person. Actually, everybody on the show is hedonistic, which is why it's terrible. You know, they just live for pleasure. But he makes a comment and he said, um, you know, because the, the girl is kind of down um, that, he's, that he's dating. He's kinda, she's kind of down because, you know, she looks at her phone all day and she doesn't match up to the world, you know, to the Instagram models and all that kind of stuff, right? You know, the problem with social media. And then he says, you know, look around. I mean, we're, we're, the, we're better off than anyone has ever been in the history of the world. Which for the moment is true, of course, until... So you find out that it's all built on an illusion and currency debasement and everything, and then it all collapses. But for the moment, it's like we have homes, we have 
we have jobs, we have places to go. I mean, it's not to say there aren't people that aren't well off, but generally speaking, I mean, even if you're, even if you don't have a job, you still, you get unemployment or, or you can go on to various social welfare programs. Um, you get healthcare. Sometimes you cost a lot, but everything costs a lot because nothing, well, right. Anyway, but overall our, and, and our life expectancy is better than it's ever been. Um, infant mortality, you know, I mean, so part of it, like we get to like, oh, the world's going to hell and you're like, but materially it's not right. Um, so there's a little bit of a conflict there. And I think that's because, um, the challenge with wealth, I mean, there's lots of ways to talk about this. The challenge is, is there's never quite enough, <laughs> right? Um, our hearts are always yearning for more. That's commandments nine and 10 coveting, desiring what isn't, what God hasn't given. Whereas, um, being content with what you have is a hard thing. Yeah. You were going to say something? Yeah. Right. Well, and the, remember we have like now third generation, at least since world war two of wealth transfer. I mean, how many people in our congregation have more, multiple homes? Cause they have a cabin up North. Right. Or, um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Or, or, um, you know, think about all the generate, all the hard work that went into, you know, building the farms or whatever it is, right? And then it tends to be, there's a cycle. Then the younger generations come along and they just squander it all. And then, and then somebody has to come along and work hard again after a big bust, you know, mm-hmm. Great Depression or whatever. So, so the, the point, though, is that um, there's never enough wealth, but, uh, or never enough for the day, at least from our estimation. Um, and that's actually an expression of, of unbelief thinking that God actually isn't taking care of us, right? In just a broad sense, or as well as we think he ought to. Um, And and that, that's just, that is what sin is, is to say to God, what you have said is not enough for me. I want more. I want more. Kind of like a Violet Beauregard from Willy Wonka, right? I want it all and I want it now. Yeah. Yeah. And so sometimes I feel, um, you know, like the pattern of, it was actually institutionalized for Israel that every 50 years they forgave all debts and they could do that because, um, because God's forgiveness and the state, if you like their forgiveness was one and the same. It was a theocratic state that they didn't have a King. They, God was the ruler, his word ruled. And then it was exercised by way of the priests. but every 50 years they forgive debt and everybody just start over. Not with, not with material wealth. Some of the wealthiest people um, in the entire ancient world are the characters in the Bible. Abraham was one of those. Um, David was one of those. Solomon, of course, was one of those. With this, I mean, how else could you afford a thousand wives and however many concubines, right? Unless you, were, you had, some, had some cash. Even like the Queen of Sheba comes and gives them a whole bunch more. And you're like, what, what's this all about? Jacob was very wealthy too, right? Um, you know, any of the farmers, I mean, put the Vorpals to shame, right? As far as the size of the farms and, you know, their livestock and how many helpers they had to have and all of that. Um, but they're not commended for that. It is a sign, sign of God's blessing upon them, of course. Um, but they aren't to trust in those things. And as the history of Israel shows, um, none of those families kept that wealth that all ended up being squandered or lost or conquered or whatever. So this is, this is still a daily prayer for us and it, it's give us this day. So it's asking for now our daily bread. And so then of course we want to ask what's meant by daily bread, but it's everything needed for body and life. So with children, I do, I've done this with my children, probably with catechism class too. There's a distinction between needs and wants, right? So what do you need? And what we think we need is often quite different than what we actually need. This is why even in the church, we, we never, um, rejected the idea of fasting, for example, is that fasting is a good way to teach um, yourself that you actually don't need like as much food as you think you do. <laughs> um, and now it's kind of a hip thing to do, right? Selective fasting or, you know, not breaking, you know, going, you know, 16, 18 hours. Um, it does kind of help reset your immune system and stuff, but whatever. Uh, but the point is, is uh, fasting would be in connection with daily bread so that you recognize the need. So that if you come even coming to church in particular hungry, and now we're, we want to redirect that physical hunger towards the spirit, things that you should be hungry for, right? Which is God's word. Um, 
or the sacrament in particular, which still has a bodily eating element. All right, forgive us our debts, which is interesting. What did Luke have? Forgive us our sins. But then it says, as we forgive everyone who is indebted to us. So that's interesting. So sins, sometimes, and we say now, the words we use are trespasses, right? Yeah. Uh, which word is right? <laughs> they're, they're all right. There's just different ways of talking. Trespassing is going where you're not supposed to go, right? And in, in this case, going outside of God's word, which is another way of defining what sin is, right? Um, debt is the kind of the extension of what the consequence of sin is that, um, well, no, the consequence is the debt. So Jesus uses stories about this or parables where he talks about, like the unforgiving servant would be a notable one, which actually comes either before or after our gospel text today. So it's in that same context where the, the servant comes to the master and has a debt that could not be paid in a lifetime, right? It's multiple lifetimes worth of debt. Um, you know, it's like the national debt. Like nobody, we, it's $80,000 per citizen or something is what it is. <laughs> Which is just like, well, this is not repayable. Well, of course. And so the master just forgives it. Um, but then he goes and he refuses to forgive his, his fellow servant. At which point then the master puts the debt right back on him and says, now you have to, now you have to, because you want to live by this whole debt slavery thing, then you can live that way. But it means you're going to be forever paying the, the penalty. Um, but if you want to live in, in my forgiveness, um, which I've just given to you, by then, which is then exercised in that forgiveness overflowing into the life of your neighbors, um, then it's freedom. Then you're set free. And you, there's no penalty to be paid. It's been paid. And we know by extension, Jesus is talking about himself. He's the one that pays the penalty for sin. He pays the debt that's owed. Um, God is uh, just, meaning when he says... If you do this, then this will happen, then it has to happen. God doesn't set aside his justice, but he puts, he puts the penalty upon the sinless one, upon Jesus. Right. So when he makes laws, uh, this, Marla and I have talked about this before. Sorry, I keep picking on you. Right, but um, you know, don't, don't make rules that you're not going to follow through on. <laughs> or threats, if you like. Right? If you're not going to follow through, then they're not going to take you seriously. It's kind of like Chicken Little kind of problem in a way, right? Um, God's the same way. He, when he makes threats, he follows through on them. Part of the challenge for us is that he often takes, he's often patient with, with us despite the threat. And so it could even be generations before the consequence is actually meted out. That's the history of Israel too. Like he says to, I'll give you an example. He says to Moses, when, they give, when he gives the covenant on Sinai, if you do everything I tell you, then you'll go into the land flowing with milk and honey and you'll, and you'll live there forever and it'll be, it'll be glorious. But if you don't, then I'm going to overthrow you and other nations are going to destroy you, right? But it doesn't happen for thousands of years. But it does happen. Because he makes the same, he says it again to Joshua when they go into the promised land. And the people say, all these things that you have said, we will do. And of course, they don't. Um, and yet, you know, and he said, they say, we want a king. And he's like, you don't really want a king because I'm your king. But since you want one, I'll give you one. But it's not going to go well for you. And they're like, yeah, whatever. And then, but it takes 14 generations of kings before finally Babylon conquers both kingdoms, or conquers the whole region. And they're, and they're deposed. So that's the challenge. It's like, God does follow through in his threats. But he, there's always, always long-suffering, patient um, for the sake of, then here's the key: for the sake of repentance, you know, that we would that we would change and we we we'd hear his word and repent, and then in the midst of that, he's always preserving faithful people too. He's not destroying everyone. Thanks be to God for that. Even if he deposes them from their land, right? So forgive us our debts. We ask for that. He's already done it in Christ, but now we're asking for it again upon us. So when we say that the life of the Christian is one of daily. Uh, daily repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Here it is. We ask for forgiveness. That forgiveness then is exercised um, in forgiveness for our debtors. And again, we're not here talking about um, earthly debt, although the church generally has been opposed to being um, indebted to others. Not only congregations to the members or members of the congregation to the church or members to one another or actually Christians just in general. It's like just... You know, Dave Ramsey's not wrong on that. 
like you don't want to be in debt to people. The only place where now, unfortunately, it's almost, I think always a necessity or almost always a necessity is with mortgage. So even Ramsey will give a say, well, except for your mortgage, <laughs> buy your car with cash, but da, da, da. buy a used car if you have to. Um, what was I bringing this up? Oh yeah. Uh, but this is a different kind of debting, right? This is of course, somebody sinned against you, right? And you, you know, you know that you deserve, um, you know, for them to make amends to you, right? To make it up to you, right? Now you got to prove that you love me again. You know, this is spouses do this sometimes, which <laughs> that's not a game you want to play by the way. Because they're all, they'll never make up for it, right? Whatever, whatever the transgression is, whatever they've done. Um, that doesn't mean that they shouldn't probably show their love, you know, do the dishes, take out the garbage, put the hay in the barn, whatever it is, right? Um, but forgiveness comes first and it's only, and it ha everything has to be covered with forgiveness. Every earthly relationship, right? Pastor to congregation, congregation to pastor, teachers to students, teachers to one another, parents to children, spouses to each other, workers, right? I mean, I don't know if you have to forgive your employer, whether you say it out loud to them or you just don't pray it, you know, maybe they're the perfect employer. I don't know. You don't have to say it out loud. All right. Um, but that's the only way to go through life actually is trusting, um, living in that forgiveness, I should say. All right. And then we talked about Adam and Eve, but there it is at the end. Do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one, which is not how we say it, right? We say deliver us from, from evil, right? And uh, sorry, I'm gonna pull it up in the Greek here again because I forget. Pretty, pretty sure, um, the, uh, the, 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 where are we? Verse 13, right? Is this, is this? Yeah, it's in the right thing, okay, sorry. Uh, and, power and the glory forever and ever and amen. No, we don't want that part. Oh yes, there it is. It's um, deliver us from, this is the, to porneru, right? The evil is, is a literal translation. Deliver us from the evil. Well, what could that be? You can see in Luke's, it says just deliver us from evil. But even then it says, go and see the footnote or evil one or, <laughs> and some add for yours is the kingdom and power and glory forever and ever. So is it evil one or is it evil things or is it sin, which would be, yeah, yeah, I think so. From the evil could mean the evil one, but that should be italicized because that's implied, right? Because where does temptation come? It comes from the world, right? From our own sinful flesh and of course from the evil one, the devil, who deceived as we saw from Adam and Eve. And of course in Adam and Eve, the devil's lies came first then their own, they conform their own hearts to that lie. And then, hey, bud, I don't know, should I call him bud? I don't know. And then, uh, then the world was corrupted as a consequence of them listening to the serpent, right, to the deceiver. So those three have gone together. So deliver us from all of that, right? And has God promised to do that? Of course he has. How does he deliver us from all of that? It's again, it's actually in part in prayer. So then, or I would say in prayer. So the end of the prayer directs us back to pray again. Right? For de how does he deliver us? Through his word, through his, um, through his gifts, through faith, trusting that he is going to provide us all that we need in the forgiveness of sins. And that's the Lord's prayer in particular. And it ends up being then um, the pattern for all prayer, for all of our prayer, this pattern of the Lord's prayer. Right? What are the things we ask for? Well, first we call on his name, and then we ask on the basis of what he's promised, right? So usually our prayers kind of follow uh, four parts. First, the name, so like our, you know, Heavenly Father, right? Or Jesus, or um, Good Shepherd, or, you know, sometimes that's directed based on what it is. Then like on the basis of what? Well, you fed your people uh, manna and quail in the wilderness, and you gave them water from the rock so that they did... Right, so give me today the daily bread that I need, the food and the water and the shelter and whatever, right? And then you ask it through Jesus Christ. So even the Lord's Prayer ends up being the pattern for all of our prayer, which is beautiful too. Um, but then as the Catechism says, when you don't know what to pray, pray the Lord's Prayer. 
So, you know, if you don't, if you can't put words to it, then use those words and that'll get you, that'll get you all the way there because it really does ask for everything. All right. Did I miss anything? Did that cover it for you? Yeah. Yeah. So that's what we do in school, right? Each morning we pray the Lord's Prayer, but we pray other prayers too. But we try to commit it to memory and then I think it's, like you said, as we grow, we grow in its meaning. He can come in. That's all right.